Okay, so I think we've got a good number of people that have joined. Again, welcome, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining from around the world. Great to be here, really enjoy talking about uh, how to avoid big startup mistakes, hopefully pointing out where the traps are for the unwary, where the pitfalls might be. So in your current venture or maybe future venture as a founder, entrepreneur, what have you, that you can hopefully avoid some of those big startup mistakes that I've seen over the years. So let's talk a little bit about the just general housekeeping. Again, please don't consider anything that I talk about today as legal advice. I'm going to be talking about general concepts at sort of a high level. So obviously any any particular issue you might have is, is very much dependent upon the facts and circumstances. So not providing legal advice, providing more educational information. I'm happy to connect with you offline. My email uh, will be made available. So you'll have a chance to reach out to me if you have any specific questions, we can address those um, separately. So just touching on the agenda for a few seconds. So we'll, I'll do a quick interview of myself and the firm. We'll provide sort of an overview of the topic, talk about a few examples, and I've characterized them in various ways I've seen them over the years. But you know, how do you document a deal? Where, where can it go wrong if you don't do it properly? Some of the issues that I've seen come up around capitalization of the company. What is good corporate hygiene? We'll talk about that. Good, good corporate housekeeping, if you will, having good books and records, making sure the contracts are tight, that you're, you're using them appropriately, that you're having proper legal advice, things of that nature. How to prepare for your first deal. Now, I also talk about, and you can see links to other presentations I've done on how to prepare for VC financing or how to position your company for VC funding. And oftentimes when I'm talking about how to prepare for your first deal, it's really focused on, on the VC financing, like a fundraise. I'll do a little bit of that here, but I wanna to try to speak a little bit more to how do you generally just prepare for a deal? So it could be a financing, but it could also be maybe your first customer engagement, your first customer agreement, your, your first agreement with an employee, consultant, um, a third party, a joint venture. Try to make it more applicable to a number of those scenarios so you're, you have at least some arrows in your quiver to use when you get to that point that you start negotiating your first agreement. We'll talk a bit about diligence because I've seen a lot of issues come up on diligence where there's been a bunch of footfalls or you know some pitfalls that people fall into and easy enough to avoid if you approach it properly. And then I'll, I'll try to leave a good amount of time for Q&A at the end. So we can address any specific questions. Uh, please feel free to put them in the chat. If I can get to them during the presentation, I'll try to do that. Um, otherwise, I may hold them until the end and address them there. So a little bit about Foley & Lard. Foley & Lard is an AMLAW 50 <clears throat> full service law firm. We do basically soup the nuts on just about everything you can imagine. Um, we are an international firm. We cover you know, basically all of the US uh, states, uh, national practice as well as a number of, we have a number of offices in other countries. We do a lot of cross-border work. So whether you're either here in the US um, and setting up shop or whether you're actually in another country wanting to come into the US, we do a lot of work with companies that are coming in to establish a presence in the United States as well. Cover areas such as corporate, which is what I do, um, regulatory compliance, tax, IP. So there really isn't much of anything that we cannot do and that we don't do and have been doing it for a very, very long time. We have we, we kind of characterize or categorize some of our practice areas into four main um, industries, healthcare, life sciences, energy, innovative technology, and manufacturing. And then we have obviously a whole bunch of subsectors and, and other areas that we focus on, but those sort of cover most of the different areas you might see as far as industries go. And then you can see on the right here, a lot of different specific areas that we provide services to our clients. A little bit about my background. So I'm a corporate attorney focusing primarily on emerging growth and venture capital. It's everything from, as I like to say, garage to global. So from very early inception where you've got an idea and not sure what to do or who to talk to, helping guide the founders to help set up the company all the way through getting their first, second, third rounds of financing all the way through exit <laughs> and helping them along the way, sort of being a strategic advisor um, I've seen a lot over the last 25 years of practice, so have seen disputes, have seen you know issues come up where sometimes the founders aren't quite um, familiar with the scenario. Where do they get help? Oftentimes, your your legal advisor is a really good first call to make. 
because they can oftentimes help you avoid some of the misfalls or, or uh, traps and, and pitfalls of energy. Now, I work out of our San Francisco and Silicon Valley office, offices, um, work with companies here locally, as well as around the rest of the US states and internationally. Love working with entrepreneurs. Um, my, I always take my hat off to the entrepreneurs and founders because you're creating such amazing, innovative things, solving problems that are either really simple, but nobody else thought of it, or super complicated that still amazes me how, you know, the, the solution was created. Anyway, love, love doing it, love um, working with people and helping them along their uh, startup journey. I'm not going to spend too much time on these. I always try to find some some quotes that sort of instill or, or, or capture some of what I'm going to be talking about. For me, what I see often over and over again is, you know, it's fine to fail, but learning from from the failure is is probably the big one of the biggest keys to success. And the other key, which comes a lot with starting a startup, creating a startup, is making sure that you do your diligence, do your homework, and you take the time to really prepare. And that, that from very early onset all the way through, you know, to an exit, making sure you're properly prepared, I think is one of the biggest keys to success that I've seen. Okay, so let's just jump right into sort of one of the first topics, which is documenting the deal. I've seen a whole bunch of deals done and executed really, really well. And I've seen a bunch of deals that didn't go well and ended up in either litigation or disputes or all sorts of problems. So. I'll talk about one example from a number of years ago. I call it the napkin deal, and probably you're familiar with that term, but it's where you basically create an agreement on, on a napkin. So you're sitting down at a coffee table, you've got a great idea, you and your friend decide to form a company, and you basically write some very minimal, um, vague notes on a napkin. You shake hands and say, great, you know, this is what we're gonna do. So, Believe it or not, that napkin deal can become a contract, can become binding, and then you're stuck with whatever you, you know, very vaguely described or what you may have given away if you gave away part of the company to a friend thinking they're going to be part of it. So the, the, the case story here was a individual who had created a, a really cool technology for the photography and videography industry. Really amazing technology. He had started a... Um, Kickstarter campaign, had a whole bunch of orders for products, and um, wasn't quite sure how to do the manufacturing. He was the technical person, the technology was solid and really good, but needed to find someone to help manufacture. And so he went to a friend of his who had a manufacturing company, and the friend said, great, yeah, I'd love to partner with you, I'll do the manufacturing, you get the technology side, and let's go and, and rock and roll. So didn't seek legal counsel, ended up signing an agreement giving this manufacturing company friend of his, 50% uh, of the company, and very short agreement, not very well worded, again, not drafted by a lawyer, and things didn't turn out very well. Started to do the production, didn't come out well, the products were defective, they weren't working, they were delayed, and at some point, the friend turned around and said, look, I can't keep doing this, you gotta start paying me to manufacture these products, and the technology co-founder said, well, wait a minute, though. I gave you 50% of the company, and I thought that included, you know, you covering all the costs for the manufacturing. So as you can imagine, you know, that it's hard to really capture a, a full agreement on an app that you don't have a lot of space. So there was a lot of things that were left out and it created a, a, a big stalemate because they couldn't do anything. It was 50-50 ownership, so they couldn't decide what the next move was going to be. So the way, way it got resolved, it, it came to me, you know, after they were at a stalemate and we took a look at the company, what the issues and challenges were, we looked at the agreement, which was horrible. And basically the, the resolution was we had to buy out the co-founder. And it was an expensive proposition, but without buying that 50% back, the, the technology co-founder was going to have a problem. He's not going to be able to go raise money because investors are not going to put money in a company where 50% of it's owned by somebody who's not delivering, not performing, may not even be participating in the growth of the company. So the, the takeaways here are do your diligence, even if it's with a friend, even if it's with a family member. I always say treat everything strictly as business. And yes, you can work with your friends, you can work with family members, but go through the same steps you would go through as if it was someone you didn't know. Do your homework, find out as much as you can about the person, find out about their personality, their temperament, their work ethic. Um, we oftentimes are now more and more recommending that they do some sort of background check 
Um, believe it or not, there's been a number of scams that have come out where had the investor, um, or in some cases the, the founder, done a little bit more diligence on the person, they would have found out that there were all sorts of problems, uh, skeletons in the closet, if you will. It's relatively easy to do that. You can hire a, a uh, licensed investigative firm, and there's some publicly available information you can get as well. But just knowing who you're getting into business with is, is really important. Ask the what if questions, ask the hard questions up front, have the difficult discussions up front so that there's no surprises going forward. Make sure you talk to a lawyer. I can't overemphasize this because, you know, if you talk to a lawyer who's, who's been in the space, who does this kind of work on a regular basis, they've seen a lot over the years. So they can help recognize patterns. They, they can help you recognize issues and offer you with suggestions because if they've looked at scenarios that are similar over the last 10, 15, 20 years, they've probably seen hundreds or thousands of scenarios. So it's easy for them to look at and pull from those different scenarios, different transactions, different situations, and try to pull out what might be the most appropriate and help strategize with you to come up with a solution that would be helpful for you. Document the deal properly. That goes hand in hand with making sure you get good legal advice. How you document the deal is really important. And for for non-lawyers, it, it seems, you know, well, I could just pull an agreement down off of Google and you know use it. I'll just change the names. Or oh, a friend of mine gave me an agreement that they used for a similar scenario. Why can't I just use that? The problem is, as they always say, the devil's in the details. So if you don't know the agreement and what it's what it's to be used for, who drafted it, with what jurisdiction in mind, you may be using an agreement that one may be missing out on a lot of things you might want to include in it or may have really problematic language that wasn't drafted by an attorney that's either vague, contradictory, inconsistent, or, or doesn't protect your rights as, as well as it could if a seasoned, experienced lawyer was drafting. So I, I've seen that happen over and over again, and it's just not worth the, the heavy price you might pay to try to remedy that if something does go wrong because you didn't have the right agreement in the first place. And, and it's it's a weird. I haven't come up with a a, a a law to name it after, but or or a maxim. But I've seen over and over again that the resolution to resolve these problems is oftentimes a huge multiple in costs. You know, than than it would have been if you just had a lawyer do it the first time. In some cases, it could be ten times the cost, which is, is odd how that ten time multiple keeps coming up. Okay, so documenting the deal again, some key. Takeaway issues or, or key issues to consider. Outline the relationship. What you're doing in, a, in an agreement is you're really trying to govern a relationship, which, as you can imagine, you know, relationships, it's difficult to govern and cover everything that you can in a relationship and interactions on, on a piece of paper. So what you want to do is you want to obviously have the material terms that are that are critical to both sides, but you also want to have in there language that's clear so that if there ever is a question dispute that you can go to that agreement and understand okay what exactly are the parties supposed to be dealing with? who's bearing the burden who's got the obligation who gets the benefit who gets to make what decision and when and why all of those things that are material to the relationship should be covered in, in a well-drafted agreement so it should outline the relationship it should include obviously the key parties the key terms the economics the ownership, if, it, if it's involving some sort of ownership. So it, that this could relate to financing and how much an investor is purchasing in the company, what kind of ownership they're going to have. It can relate to a commercial agreement. So maybe you want to do a license agreement. Well, who's going to own the IP? Who's going to have a license to the IP under what circumstances? So there's a whole bunch of scenarios where the economics and ownership can be really, really critical. What's the timetable obligation of parties, <clears throat> confidentiality, limitation of liability, identification? Those are all some of the, the sort of key issues. There's a lot of other issues as well that I have listed here. It would probably take two or three pages, but those are some of the ones that I see being more of the key issues. And then obviously some of the other ones as well. It's like, for example, what jurisdiction is going to govern the contract? If there is a dispute, where do you end up going to handle your dispute? What's the venue? All, all really important and all things that a, a, a lawyer that does this kind of work on a regular basis can help advise for. Yeah, probably the most important key is talk to a lawyer. And you'll, you'll hear me say that throughout just because I've seen so many deals go wrong where there wasn't good counsel advising the um, parties. 
Another topic that comes up is, um, I'm just going to pause for a minute to see if we have any questions. Yeah, so feel free. I know I mentioned this early on. So if you do have questions, put it in the chat. If I can get to it while I'm talking, I'm happy to do that. Otherwise, what I'll try to do is reserve some time at the end to make sure we, we address any questions that folks have. So we talked about documenting the deal. Moving on to the topic of capitalization, I see that a lot with startups because unless you've been around the block and have had a bunch of startups before and you understand what the capitalization is and how it's important at a number of different times relating to the company's uh, initial formation all the way through exit, you can make some either not have the information to make some bad decisions or miss out on making good decisions if you're negotiating, for example, with an investor or even with a consultant uh, or vendor where you're going to be giving them some sort of equity. How much do you give them? How do you allocate? Those sorts of issues are really important. And understanding the capitalization is going to be really, really critical. So this particular example came up a number of years ago with a company, small private company. They were uh, doing some great, they had some great contracts, great technology, but they didn't really have counsel that was helping them. And so they decided to increase the number of authorized shares. And so with the corporation, you have a number of authorized shares you can issue. You can't issue more than you have that authorized. But you can amend your charter, your certificate of incorporation, to increase the number of shares so that, you know, when you get to a point in time as you grow, oftentimes you need to increase the number of authorized shares because you need to dole out more shares, whether it's to employees, consultants, or maybe you're going to be doing another financing round. So you obviously need to have more shares or need to create a different um, series of shares or class of shares. So for whatever, whatever reason, if you need to have more authorized shares, you need to make sure the board approves it, stockholder approves it, and then you also need to make sure you file an amendment with the uh, Secretary of State where you formed your company. So in this case, this company had initially formed with a very small number of authorized shares. They then decided to do a forward stock split, which essentially means you take the number of shares you have. So if you have a thousand shares and you want to create more shares by splitting them, you can split them, let's say the 10,000 shares can be split into 10,000 shares. That happens a lot because if you set up your company with a small number of shares, at least in today's market, it's been like this for, for many, many years, employees and consultants, they like to see a lot of zeros after the number of shares they're getting by way of options or restricted stock. So, you know, if you were to turn to an employee you want to hire and bring on and say, hey, great, I'll give you one share. Even if that one share is worth a lot, it, in the mindset of, of the employee or the prospect, they're going to be thinking, yeah, that doesn't sound too good because, you know, my buddies are at these other companies and they're all getting tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of shares. Yeah, giving me one share doesn't, doesn't sit well with me. Even though that one share may be worth a lot, it's still, in the, in, from an optics perspective, it just doesn't come across very well. So, so a lot of times companies want to have a lot of shares so that when you make an offer to an employee or to a consultant, that you're making that offer with a bunch of zeros behind the number that you're going to be giving them as equity. Anyway, so that's what they wanted to do, but they didn't do it properly. They handle all the paperwork internally. Language wasn't what were drafted. They never bothered to file an amendment to a certificate of incorporation to increase the number of shares or to do the, the split properly. So the split never happened. It was never valid. They treated it as it was valid. So they gave a bunch of their employees a whole bunch of options with a bunch of zeros after them, thinking they'd actually done the forward split, but they actually didn't. So all of those issuances were invalid. So the people that had stock, thought that they had stock, actually didn't have it. So what we had to do is we had to come in and clean it up. It was a big mess because we had to go out and tell everyone that, oops, sorry guys, the stock you thought you had, you really don't have. We're now going to correct it. So we're going to go ahead and now have to issue a new stock. Some time had elapsed. So obviously the company had grown a bit. So the value now went up. So there were all sorts of issues related to that. But the, but the big problem is you had to disclose that the stockholders. It never sounds good when you have to go out to the people that have invested with you, whether it's you know sweat equity or whether it's investor equity in cash, and say, yeah, guys, we kind of screwed up. So the takeaways were it, it can get complicated. The capitalization structure, the ownership structure of the company really requires proper planning. You got to make sure you have the, the right type of documentation, the right approvals, and you follow the, the required process for making sure implement the changes that you want to have um, be valid changes so people can rely on them and, and trust them. 
what you're telling them is actually true. Again, the, the resolution was a lot more expensive. It took a lot more time to clean up the mess than if they'd done it the, correctly the, the first time. Around. So another topic I see a lot is um, with regard to capitalization, what should founders, entrepreneurs, what, what should the company give out or allocate? And this could be allocation to the founders themselves when they're forming the company. How do they split it amongst two or three co-founders? It can also relate to the allocation when you're talking about bringing in an employee, bringing in a consultant. How do you divvy up and how do you figure out what's the right amount to give founders, co-founders, and firms, consultants? And, and I'll tell you, there, there's no, there's no, you know, absolute rule of thumb. It's, it's basically kind of look at what's appropriate given the circumstances, what each individual is going to be contributing. There are some some uh, trade organizations that have some information out there. For example, Founder Institute has a website you can go to, and they've got some good information about what they've seen as far as you know canvassing over the years, looking at what sort of equity is given out to advisors with regard to their participation on on an advisory board <laughs> for companies. So there's some good resources out there, and of course, you know, talk to your attorneys too because. As they've helped a lot of startups, they've had to run across that scenario too, and that might have some good information ideas. But I always think about start ahead. So think about where you might be in a couple of years, and then try to work your way backwards to figure out what the right allocation might be. That's one approach. Because if you're going to go out and, and fundraise, recognize you're going to be selling pieces of the company to investors, right? They're going to be buying percentage interests in the company. So you want to think about what are you going to need over the next three, four, five years? How much money might you have to raise? What do you think you might have to give up to get to that point? Factor that in and then work your way back as to, OK, well, if, that, if I know I'm going to be giving up X percent generally, you can't know that until you actually have a term sheet with an investor and you've done the numbers. But you can at least have a general idea of what that might be. Then figure out, okay, now I want to bring on, I got to grow and I need a team of 10 people, 12 people. I need, you know, I need to bring in a CTO, I need to bring in a, a CIO, et cetera. So how much is that going to cost? What What's the equity that is competitive that I'm going to have to at least think about maybe putting aside to bring those people in? And then make sure you've got a, a spreadsheet where you kind of calculate all that out and figure out what the dilution will be on you as the founder. So you either don't end up giving too much initially Harken back to the napkin deal I mentioned, where they keep giving up 50% of the company to a co-founder, or where perhaps you're you're not giving enough to be competitive and you're looking to bring on employees or even a co-founder. Ownership control, economic solution, incentivizing your team, those are sort of the, the categories of things to be thinking about. Obviously, ownership, the control and economics. There's often time that it's sort of a tension point between you know making sure you've got appropriate control. But also making sure you got appropriate economics in place. And so, especially when you're looking at co founders and allocating amongst co founders, you want to be very careful and thinking through what is each co founder bringing to the table? What is their you know, initial commitment? Like, what am I going to contribute when I come into this company for the shares I'm going to be getting? It could be technology, it could be cash, it could be contacts, but it should have something that you can think about and say, yeah, I understand. To me, that makes sense. That's a lot. Of, that has a lot of value. As well as thinking about what they're going to be contributing down the road to make the company successful. So great that they came in, they you know contributed some contacts, maybe put in some cash, but then their work ethic doesn't jive with your work ethic. They're looking to only work a few hours a day. Versus you're looking to work, you know, as a startup founder, it's oftentimes a 24-7 job. So that can cause tensions very quickly. So you have to kind of think all that out and then come up with what you think might be a fair resolution. And have the conversations I mentioned, have the difficult conversations up front where you put all the cards on the table and say, hey, look, you know, this is what I this is what I want to do. This is the plan for the company. It's going to require X, Y, and Z understand what they're going to contribute, and then make a determination as to what they should be given. Um, we'd love to be able to tell you specific percentages, but it, it's so fact-specific and circumstance-specific. I'm happy to chat with anyone offline if they're going through that scenario, but um, those are some of the things we're thinking about. Proper documentation, I'll mention that briefly. So 
mentioned that in the example I gave you where the company didn't do the stock split properly, they didn't authorize enough shares. But another situation comes up when you're starting a company, or even if you've started your company and you're bringing people in, is making sure you've got the right documentation with regard to capitalization and giving equity to people. You want to make sure people are incentivized, but you want to also make sure that they, you know, are going to contribute to the, the growth of the company. And if they don't, that their relationship terminates, what did they end up leaving? And so oftentimes, and I'm sure a lot of people, if they've been in the space, know that you typically don't want to give anyone stock that's fully vested on day one, because on day two, when they walk away, they walk away with that stock. And unless you've got something in your documents that says you can buy it back, you're stuck. You now have someone you gave stock to that's not participating in helping the company grow. So oftentimes you'll put in place uh, vesting requirements. And I want to take a moment to talk about this because it's it's treated differently depending on whether you're talking about restricted stock or you're talking about options. So I'll talk about restricted stock first. If you give someone restricted stock, on day one, they are an owner. They have stock in the company. So what do you do if that person doesn't work out? You want to make sure that the company has a right to repurchase that stock if the relationship terminates. And so you'll build into the documentation a right of repurchase. That right of repurchase will cover all of the shares that they get, hence they're called restricted shares. And then that right will lapse over time, generally over a four-year period with a one-year cliff, which essentially means for the first year, all the stock is subject to repurchase if the relationship terminates. After the first year of service, then 25% of the stock is released from the repurchase right, which means you know if the relationship terminated after the first year, that person can walk away and they will own 25% of the stock that they got without any restri restrictions, without the restrictions of repurchase. And then it, it typically vests monthly thereafter in equal uh, increments for in the rest of the, for the three years, so a total of four years until they're they're fully vested and, and the repurchase right lapses as to all of the shares. So that's a way to protect the company so that the person leaves and they have vested, the company can repurchase that stock that is still invested. Switching over to options, options work a little bit differently because an option is a right to purchase stock at a future date at a specific price, an exercise price. So when you give someone an option on day one, they don't own any interest in the company. They don't have a a share of the company or shares in the company. So they're not an owner, a stockholder, if you will. They have a contractual right to purchase stock at a future date. And that right, the future right, um, vests over time, the same, typically the same time frame, four years or one year cliff, so that as the, the options vest, then they can exercise and purchase those number of options that are vested. So using the same scenario, you hire someone, you give them a million shares, option shares. So they have to complete a full year's worth of service. After that, they can exercise and purchase 250,000, 25% of those shares at that exercise price. And then monthly thereafter, they will invest in, in you know, whatever amount is equal to being fully vested after the remaining three years, so total of four years. So the nice thing about the options is if the relationship terminates, the company doesn't need to buy them back. The unvested options disappear. They expire. They're no longer good. So it, it makes it a little bit easier from that standpoint. So really important that the documentation is done properly. There's all sorts of you know board approvals, stockholder approvals, and in some cases filings that need to be made with the state regarding the securities laws. But essentially, those are two different ways that you can have the right documentation with the right protections with regard to granting which crypto stock or options. Let's check and let's see. Okay. All right. So let's um, move on and talk a little bit about um, corporate hygiene. The corporate hygiene, you can call it that. You can call it corporate housekeeping. It's just good or corporate governance in some cases. It's just basically making sure that your your company has good books and records, that they're clean. They're well drafted, they're clear, they're dated if they need to be dated, they're signed if they need to be signed. Um, so that if there's ever an issue, you know where they are, they're in good shape. Uh, you don't have any problems where you're missing a signature and then you're not sure if you can even enforce the agreement because the person never signed it. All sorts of things that come up under 
sort of good corporate hygiene. That's that's also part of what's important in making sure that you're one protecting the company, but also making sure the company is in the best position possible. So that if something comes up, and it could be a a financing, right? So if you have an investor that signs a term sheet and now says, "Great, you know, founder, can you give me access to your data room? Because now I'm going to do my diligence." And not only the investor, but the investors' counsel are going to be looking at all the documents. And if they run across documents that are unsigned, undated, uh, missing pages, or you don't have documents for important arrangements that were made, or maybe the wrong documentation, all of those can create red flags. And in some cases, and I've seen it happen, where if too many red flags are raised or red flags that can't be corrected or cured come to the attention of the investor, you know, that can be a scenario where they just say, you know what, I'm, I'm not interested in moving forward. Your corporate hygiene, hygiene is horrible. I'm worried that if I do a deal and invest, that my money's going to go down the drain because you haven't been able to keep your corporate records clean. There's all sorts of problems. You don't have agreements with key customers or the agreements are on bad terms, all, all sorts of scenarios if you don't have good corporate hygiene. So it's something that I know a lot of founders, especially founders that, that are just starting on maybe their first startup journey, don't focus on enough because it's sort of back of back of mind. It's less important than actually getting the technology done, proof of concept, pilot studies, getting revenue in the door, going and talking to investors, which obviously is, is critical. But it doesn't take that much time, and it's something that you work with your advisors on to make sure you've got it set up early on. So once you set it up and you've got a good process and a, an approach for making sure you're keeping good records, it's much easier to just maintain that going forward. And then when you get to a point in time where there's an issue, it's much easier and more efficient and less costly to then figure out what you need to do to, to try to address the issue. Go back really quickly. What I didn't mention is with regard to the corporate side of things, getting the right approvals. So do you need board consents? For example, if you're going to be entering into a lease agreement, you're going to be granting options, you're going to be granting stock. All of those sorts of things are things you want to make sure that the board of directors approves. And in some cases, depending upon what it is and looking at your governing documents, you may also need to get shareholder approval. So I'll give you one example. If you set up an equity incentive plan for the company, you need to have make sure the board approves the equity incentive plan, but you also need to make sure that the shareholders approve the equity incentive plan too. That's really critical because depending on the type of um, equity and specifically options that you want to grant, there are different types of options. There's incentive stock options and, and non-qualified stock options. And the incentive stock options have um, particular tax treatment that you can only get, which is favorable, if you've had your shareholders approve your equity incentive plan within, I think it's 12 months from the time it was adopted, and certainly before you, you go out and start issuing uh, or granting options. So easy enough to miss if you don't have someone advising you, but then you're in a scenario where you told everyone you gave them a certain type of option, didn't do it properly, so they don't have that type of option. So then when it comes time for an exit, which is typically when employees will cash out on their options, they don't get the better tax treatment, it, it can be problematic. So you want to avoid those sort of scenarios from happening. Okay, so here, here's an example. Talked a little bit about options where I was working on a M&A transaction. Company had been around for a long time. They still thought of themselves as a startup and they've been operating for, I think, over 10 years. And finally came time to do a deal. They were really excited they were going to sell a company. And during diligence, the buyer's council had raised a bunch of issues because the company had, over the years, granted options, not with any legal advice, but you know, at different prices and different price points, and that created some issues. They didn't have valuations. Typically, when you're going to be granting options, you need to price the options at the fair market value at the time you're making the grant. A good way to do that is you go out and get what's called a foreign on valuation. It's done by an independent third-party firm, and that gives you a value, a fair market value for the stock of the company, the common stock. Then you can use that and rely upon it the board can approve the option grants and say, look, we're going we're gonna to issue you X number of options at an exercise price that's the fair market value determined by this 490 that we just got. And then you've got a good basis and position to defend if the IRS ever comes and audits you and says, hey, we don't think you priced your options properly. We don't think they were in fair market value. 
because if you don't price them properly, there can be tax consequences. So that, that wasn't done properly. They had all sorts of issues. So what they had to do is they had to figure out all of the tax implications for the folks that had been given options improperly. They had to figure out what the tax it was going to be on the employee, and there were multiple employees. And then they had to, as a result of the sale of the company, they had to figure out of the proceeds from the sale, they had to calculate how much they're going to have to pay to cover that employee's tax hit. And it ended up being an amount of you know several million dollars for it was probably I think a, a few dozen um, employees that were impacted. So you know that can be a, a big hit. It was it was a lot that um, they were the the owners of the company were going to have to take. And now if they just had taken care of tax problems that if they planned properly from the beginning they would have avoided. Talking a little bit about other areas where I've seen you know, good corporate hygiene or governance um, fall by the wayside. And one that's very common is contract mismanagement or, or not having a good a management process for your contracts. So it's it's easy to oversee that or or, or to, to lose sight of the importance of that early on because you might not have a lot of contracts. I mean, you've got one contract here, maybe two contracts. It's, it's less than a, a handful, so you're not really worried about it. But as the company grows and scales, and you start adding on employee agreements, offer letters, consulting agreements, advisory agreements, and then you've got your financing documents, and you've got customer agreements, vendor agreements. All of that starts to add up. And if you don't have a good organized process for keeping track of it, it can be a, a nightmare when you get to a point in time when now you have a financing and investors are looking at the documents and you've got to pull everything together in the data room. And it can take you and or your counsel a lot of time to make sure it's all correct, it's all properly documented. Again, going back to what I mentioned earlier, that you've got the signed agreements, the dated agreements, so and there aren't any holes or gaps anywhere. It just adds a lot of stress and time and cost for the company. And a lot of gray hair is usually for the CFO, which is generally the person that gets tasked with uh, managing a lot of that in a certainly in a financing or even in an acquisition or, or merger. So um, taking care of it early on is is really, um, really helpful and will save you some, some major issues down the way. Um, yeah. uh, one question that came up, so I'll, I'll see if I can take this one. So um, early stage founder asking about a uh, question about early stage, you know, obviously startups are, are Oftentimes, not bootstrapped or bootstrapped, but the budget is very low. So, how do you make sure you can get and engage with the lawyer without either um, spending too much or, or giving up too much of the company? So, let me take the second part first. You know, there are some law firms that will that will take uh, an interest. You know, usually not in lieu of fees. It's usually in connection with the fees, maybe some discounted rates, and then a very small interest. It presents a, a major conflict of interest, so it can be done if it's done properly, but you have to have proper disclaimers and proper waivers signed, and the percentage that's given to the lawyer should never be more than what's considered sort of a de minimis amount, meaning it's such a small amount for the lawyer that no matter what, it's not going to influence their decision in, in providing sort of zealous advocacy for the client because it's not going to make a difference one way or the other. For their financial situation. So as long as you do it that way, yes, you can, you know, certainly give some stock away. But if it's anything that's a significant percentage, and I, I would certainly um, question whether or not that is proper. Again, I'm I'm in California, licensed in California. Most states have a very similar um, set of ethical rules that lawyers have to abide by. Taking taking a lot of stock to a point where it can influence your decision and how you're representing the client can be a real, real major problem. And then as far as fees go. A lot of firms, you know, are pretty flexible as far as talking about, you know, whether it's this kind of fee or whether it's some sort of alternative fee arrangement. Um, we certainly will consider that on a case-by-case on a, um, -case basis. So uh, it shouldn't dissuade you from seeking good counsel. Again, example, if you are talking to investors and you think you're going to have an investor that's ready to, to sign up and put some money in the company, then, then talk to a lawyer because oftentimes what happens is by the time the lawyer gets engaged, helps you with the transaction, you close the transaction, with, transaction within a month or two, then they typically would get paid out at closing. So that's an easy gamble for a lawyer to make. Hey, you've got a term sheet. This looks pretty solid. In all likelihood, unless something really unusual comes up, the investor's going to invest. 
get through to the closing, help them close the transaction, and then get paid out from the closing proceeds. So you'll find, I think, a lot more flexibility with lawyers than you might otherwise um, think. So back to back to the, the corporate governance issue is, you know, set up a process, um, get everything organized, even set up a data room. So what we often do with a lot of our clients is we will set up a data room on day one. It's there, it may be empty, but it's it's there, it's in the structure that investors like to see so that as the company starts to get documents, either we can access, we can allow them access to upload, upload themselves or we'll keep track and upload the documents so that when they get to a point in time when now there's an investment that's starting, financing that's going to be starting, it's very easy to do a quick check to make sure everything's updated and then quickly turn on that data room, open it up to the investor and its counsel. In other cases, I've seen where that hasn't been the case and they're disorganized. It can take a week, two weeks, in some cases more before they're ready to actually open a data room. And that's never a good signal to a prospective uh, investor. Okay, so we're at uh, 940. You got about 20 minutes left. So I'll see if I can get through the rest of this and then uh, maybe add a few more thoughts and notes and then open up for some QA. So some other missteps for the unwary, using the wrong agreement. I mentioned this a little bit earlier on, but I, I want to take a moment and really focus on this because I, I see this happening over and over again. And, and I, I get it. I understand budget's tight. Don't want to incur a whole bunch of fees. So you talk to a buddy and your buddy sends you an agreement that they use for their company. You're in a similar business. So you think, well, hey, if it, they used it, it was good for them. I should be able to use it. It should be fine for me. And, you know, you might be lucky and, and use it and nothing happens. But if there is an issue, if it hasn't been really vetted and reviewed by a lawyer, you don't have the right provision, you know, you may you may have missed some stuff that could be to your advantage. You may include stuff in there that's to your disadvantage, more favorable to the other side, and you just don't know about it. Or it might be for the wrong jurisdiction. The laws are different in California than they are in Florida. You pulled an agreement from or a buddy from a business that's similar who's in Florida gave you their agreement. It, it nicely follows what Florida's requirements are, but doesn't follow California's requirements. And now you've got a scenario where you've got a, a agreement in place that's not compliant with California law. I'll give you one good example, and this has been coming up more and more frequently. And it's really an area to be really, really careful about is restrictive covenants. And what I mean by that is I mean non-compete, non-solicitation agreements. There's been a movement, you know, Recently, it's been going on for a while, but it's it's becoming more and more widespread that courts and states are adopting laws or, or rendering decisions that are um, basically signaling that non-competes are problematic. And California has, for many, many years, had a very um, uh, strong set of laws in the books that basically says non-competes are unenforceable. Against public policy, not going to enforce them. There are some very, very limited um, exceptions. For example, if you're selling your business and you're the key person, you certainly don't, the buyer doesn't want to pay you a bunch of money for you to then close the transaction, walk across the street and open up the same business and compete. So in those limited circumstances, yes, you can have a non-compete, it can be enforceable, but every state's different. Some states are very, very anti-non-compete like California, there's a number of other states as well. And if you have the wrong kind of agreement, it can be completely unenforceable. Not just the non-compete portion of the agreement, but I'm talking about the entire agreement could be potentially rendered unenforceable if it gets challenged. So that's a great example where you go to a buddy of yours in a state that's very much more liberal when it comes to uh, restrictive covenant covenants. You grab their agreement, you have someone sign it that's joining your company and they happen to be in California. And then there's a disagreement that ends up in a dispute and they leave and they start competing. And you think, well, great, you know, I'm gonna go shut them down because I got them to sign this agreement. It's a really detailed agreement. It's very restrictive. So I covered myself. Surprise, surprise, no, you didn't because it doesn't matter what your agreement says, California says absolutely no way, unless it's within that very limited exception, absolutely not enforceable. So that's a good example of using an agreement that you got from the internet or getting one from a friend if it isn't really vetted or you know it's been reviewed by an attorney or drafted by an attorney, you could be getting yourself into a big mess. Um, 
Okay, another question. Uh, what if you don't have enough revenue to warrant spending money on getting your core hygiene in place? How much revenue, total dollars or percentage, do you need to make it worth the effort? Great question. You know, I don't have a specific price in mind. It really depends on the, the company and, and how bad or how good their records are. What I'll tell you, though, is it's very easy. I mean, do a little bit of homework, read a bunch of articles, talk to some lawyers. I mean, if you're shopping for a lawyer, you can it's it's an interview process, right? You're looking for the right fit. So talk to some lawyers and get their thoughts on what you know what good corporate hygiene and what do they do for their clients? What sort of offerings do they have for their clients? And, and you know, how do they typically charge for that? But with a little bit of, of good homework, you can get at least a decent understanding. And then think about it from a logistical or you know, sort of a practical standpoint. If you open up a data room, it, it could be box, it could be Dropbox, something easy. You set it up, organize the folders in a way that it's easy to look and find documents, name the documents in a way that makes sense. So when you look at the file name, you understand what the document is. Make sure that all your documents are signed and dated. I mean, that's kind of what I'm talking about. With regard to the right type of agreement for the right situation, that's where you really do need to go talk to a lawyer. But but again, you know, oftentimes I'll work with clients and they'll tell me what they need. I'll give them a scope of work give them an estimate, and then we work off of that. <clears throat> so I think it can be done. You just got to manage that process a little. Okay. Let's uh, talk about another area where having the right contract with the right provisions is really important. So here's an example of a scenario I had a number of years ago where a client came to me and said, hey, look, um, I got a problem. I got this great software. I think it's going to be, you know, great uh, product it's going to you know make a ton of money and you know it's a great market for it i can scale it they're all excited but i've got a problem problem is they had someone that came in as the engineer to design and write the code and create the software but they never got them to sign the right agreement they didn't really have an agreement they they signed the agreement the engineer gave them when they were providing the consulting work and of course the engineer gave it to them so it was very favorable for the engineer it didn't have the right type of provisions that they wanted to have, they should have had in there, so that whatever that engineer created for the company belongs to the company. And that's a really key issue. It's probably one of the most important issues. It comes up all the time, and it's one that everyone is really focused on, especially investors. So let me just repeat that. The, the agreement with the consultant did not have the, the right provision so that whatever the consultant created for the company was owned by the company. And so we, we oftentimes refer to those as an intellectual property assignment agreement or an invention assignment agreement or an assignment agreement. It, it also can be called oftentimes, um, if it's not built into the actual consulting agreement, if you're hiring like a, an employee or even a consultant, but you might hear it referred to as a CIIAA or PIIAA, which means Confidential Information Invention Assignment Agreement or Proprietary Information Invention Assignment Agreement, both mouthfuls. But essentially, it's got a confidentiality component so that whatever they are learning about your company that's confidential, they can't go and laugh to the world or tell other people, including competitors. And the other component of that is that there is a provision there that says whatever they develop for the company belongs to the company. So that if at some point in time they walk away, or they finish their assignment, they develop the software, it's fantastic, we are starting to make a ton of revenue from it. They can't later on come back and say, by the way, never signed that agreement, I still own it, so you need to pay. And that's what happened in, in this example. We didn't have the right agreement, didn't have any agreement. So the relationship ended, the engineer walked away, company went on, developed it, continued to develop it. It started to get traction in the market. It was now doing really well. That engineer came back because they heard about it and said, hey, wait a minute, um, that's my software. I, I wrote it. I, I, did, I own it. And the company had no, no position to counter that because they didn't have any agreement that said, yes, he wrote it, but then he assigned all of his rights over to the company. So that creates a scenario where that person that owns the software that now your company is, is dependent upon has tremendous leverage to negotiate a buyout. And Unfortunately, if, if you need that software and you can't recreate it, then you're kind of stuck. If, and I've had a few scenarios where that's happened, but the company said, look, we can pivot. We don't need that. It's been a few years. We've got totally new technology that's not built on the old technology. Um, we're not going to use it at all. But some, in some cases, that can be expensive because they kind of have to start the little process from scratch. 
So you certainly want to make sure if you've got an agreement from someone you're reviewing, have a lawyer review it, make sure you understand what you're signing. It's usually better for the company to have their own agreement because then you know it can be drafted properly to get your lawyer to do it, to have the right provisions in there so you don't um, leave something out. Okay. So in this case, as I mentioned, we had to negotiate a settlement with that consultant. It was, it was pretty partisan. And here are the agreements that the acronyms I was mentioning before. State laws do differ. So similar to the restrictive covenants that I was talking about, um, the state laws do, do differ as well. So you want to be very careful. Don't pull a deal from a prior um, transaction or from a, from a friend or, or a colleague and use it if it's, it hasn't been reviewed by a lawyer. So we'll talk a little bit about preparing for your first deal. I think we got about 10 minutes left, so we can spend a little bit of time on this. <laughs> Excuse me. So I know early on I said preparing for your first deal, this could be your first financing, it could be your first customer agreement, your first agreement with a vendor. Obviously, those are all different scenarios, but the preparation part should be very similar. So, you know, organize, make sure you understand what the relationship is, what you want the relationship to be, how are you going to govern that relationship. If you're talking to investors, obviously anticipate investor questions. You know, with regards to sort of your, your financing <clears throat> transaction, oftentimes I'll see founders are, are more interested in making sure that they can ask, answer questions that the investors ask, that they can deliver the right deck that's got the right bells and whistles in it to get their interest. But flip that over too. So it should be a, it should be a two-way or a parallel um, track. You should also be asking questions from the investors. You should also be doing your homework and really looking at the backgrounds of the investors. What have they invested in before? You know, how many funds they have? How much money under management? Those are all important things you should know about because obviously if you're talking to an investor who's really excited, but it's not their space. You know, you're in, in you know, uh, FinTech and they're in healthcare and it's not healthcare or anything related to fintech, then they're probably not the right investor. It doesn't mean that they can't invest and, you know, it might work out, but their investment may just be just a check, and that's that's it. They may not really have a lot of, of other things to offer because they don't know the industry, they don't know your market, they don't know the technology. Whereas if you've got someone that was in that space that has regularly invested in companies like that, they understand the space, they understand the market, they oftentimes can open the right doors because their connections are used within that industry or that sector. And those connections could potentially be more valuable than someone that introduces to someone else, but it's not in the right industry and they don't really have the right information. It may not be as helpful. Organize your company documents. Really critical when you're doing a financing, obviously for an MA transaction as well. Um, not, as, not as critical if you're doing a vendor agreement or a customer agreement. You know, depending on the customer, if it's your first big sort of enterprise customer and it's a large company, they usually will have a whole bunch of vetting that you're going to have to go through. So they may ask for a lot of stuff. They may ask for information about your company because they're going to have to go through and, and vet you as a vendor. And that can be uh, timely. It can, it can be a little costly because they may ask for a whole bunch of stuff. So just being prepared is, is going to be super helpful for you even in that scenario. As I mentioned earlier, Creating a data room would save you a ton of time. It, it's, you know, you can house it internally. You can use one of the, you know, readily available type of data rooms that are that are there, like Box or Dropbox, a little bunch of others as well. Um, but start it early on, organize it, and then just start keeping it updated on a regular basis. As soon as you sign your term sheet, if it's a financing, the the very next step is okay, great. Open your data room. Let's start diligence. The sooner you can open the data room, the sooner the investor and their counsel can start diligence, which means the sooner you can close your transaction, and hence the sooner you can get cash in your bank account. And the other thing I'll say is use your advisors really efficiently. Yeah, I get oftentimes uh, clients that will call that haven't really looked into something, haven't really done their own homework, which is fine. But then it takes a lot longer to explain something. And hence, they end up spending more money because if they had spent maybe five or 10 minutes kind of reading up on the subject and then really fine tuned the question they're asking, they would have gotten more out of the conversation because it would have been much quicker, more effective and, and less costly. Um, and it, it's the same way when you're doing transactions, too. So as an example, you know, when you're ready to, to 
start a transaction, whether it's a financing or let's say it's a vendor agreement or your first customer agreement or joint venture agreement, the more you can sort of think about how do I present as much information to my advisor as I can. So they've got everything sort of distilled down into the sort of the essence of what I want them to know and what they may need to know to properly advise me on this, the better they're going to be able to take that information, spend the time to review it, understand it, and then come back to you with intelligent questions and then be able to give you the guidance that will be super helpful, including, you know, either reviewing and commenting on agreement or drafting an agreement for a particular circumstance. So take that time initially because I can tell you it, it will help say, it, one, it'll make the relationship go a lot more smoothly, more efficiently, but it'll also help save time and, and money. I can't tell you how many times I'll get a very short email that says, hey, I need, I need to prepare, I need you to prepare an agreement. Very few details, doesn't even tell me the parties, doesn't tell me, you know, some of the key terms that we talked about earlier. And so I, I look at that and say, okay, great, happy to help, love to jump on this, um, I need some info. So then we're, we're going back and forth and it, it takes some time before I get all the information. They're not ready, so it takes another three days before they can give me the documents I need. Um, so all of that causes delays and then they're up against a, a deadline because they told the other party that, oh yeah, I'll have an agreement for you by Friday. But it took them until Thursday to get me the documents that they needed, which puts, you know, obviously more pressure to get it then done and done right in order to deliver it on Friday. So the more you can work sort of collaboratively with your advisors, whether it's a lawyer or accountant or whoever it may be, I think overall it'll be much, much better um, prepared. Okay, and then we're almost at the hour. So just a few parting thoughts or really just one, one parting thought is, well, to do your homework. Obviously we talked about that. And then spend the time up front to organize your startup, get everything, get established good practices and good organizational habits. If you start them early on, as I mentioned before, it just makes everything you're gonna be doing for your company that much more efficient. Future transactions, dealing with folks, whether it's investors, vendors, customers, uh, joint venture partners or other partners, it just makes it that much more efficient, less costly, and obviously, you know, sets you up for the best possible position and, and sets you up for success, essentially. If you do your homework and you make sure you're prepared. So I'll, um, I, I put this on here because I want to make sure you've got some good resources. So, you know, if you go to our website, it's, it's a pretty vast website. So there's a lot of different places you can get a lot of good information. But I put a couple of these links here because we have a, a couple of particular resources where we have a bunch of blogs, podcasts, and, and some of those are all focused on things that might be relevant to startups. So it could be topics about financing, due diligence, M&A, trends, things of like that where we're constantly keeping an eye out of what's going on in the market and either addressing specific issues, i.e. new laws, changes in, in laws, or maybe trends that we're seeing. <clears throat> and we're, we try to go on a regular basis and, and post that. But we also have um, a what we call our, our um, fully Ignite, which is a document generator. So we have a bunch of documents you can actually create by going to the website. This, they're, they're fairly, there's a number of them you can go and, and pull down if you need a confidentiality agreement or things like that. So there's that resource as well. And then there's also um, a newsletter we provided. I think we'll, we'll drop the, um, the link to be able to sign up to get the newsletter, which also covers a lot of things about trends, what we're seeing in the market, new developments and changes. So there's a lot there. We also started, I, I with a colleague started um, a video series called Startup Advisors. They're very short videos. I know everyone's busy, busy schedules, so it's it's you know under I think a couple minutes per video, but it touches on different topics. Some of which I've talked about here, some of which I talk about in a number of my, number of my other presentations as well. But it's it's made to be really easy to just pop in, listen for a couple of minutes, and get something out of it that might be helpful. So there's some really good resources there, and, and this will be made available as well when you get the slides. Uh, you can go and check those things out. And then my information is up on on the screen here. My email, reach out to me if you have questions or if you want to discuss anything offline. Um, let me see if we've got uh, any questions. So we do have some questions. Let's see. Answer the one about um, budgeting so you can afford lawyers to be able to come in and help you with your needs. Um, let me take a look and see if we have any Q&A. 
looks like. Uh, so right now, I think I've answered the questions that have come in. So if you have any more questions or if there, if there are questions I haven't answered, um, let me know. We certainly have some time to spend answering some questions. If, if we don't have any questions, we're happy to end a little bit earlier on early as well. So um, I guess what I can what I can sort of end with is one of the one of the benefits of, of talking to a lawyer is again having seen a bunch of scenarios, not only the transactions that, that go well, but in some cases even more importantly, the transactions that don't go well, being able to recognize those. And as you know, you get close to a transaction that could be going off the rails or where there's some pitfalls, you know, oftentimes we're in a pretty good position to see those in advance and to guide you around them or to help you avoid them altogether. I just I can't tell you how many times I've seen founders um, basically head in hand thinking, um, oh man, if I'd only approach it differently. I'll give you a couple of examples. Once we have a little bit of time. So one one client in particular had come to me, they had set up a really smart individual had come up with some great ideas, some great technologies, great ways to build not only a, a startup, but multiple startups focusing, focusing on different different issues, different things. And he had gone and had met someone through a mutual acquaintance who was also trying to start a company. So they started a company together. And basically had a scenario where there were both 50 50 owners they my client had actually started a bunch of companies and had them up and running and then had sort of brought in somebody to a couple of the companies and basically gave him 50 percent made him an officer my client was more interested and focused on technology he's an engineer by training so didn't want to want to really spend as much time on the management side of things so he kind of left that to the other person. And my client was starting to get into some really cool, very promising technology and some, some relationships with some big companies that we were going to be able to do some work with that weren't really involving the other companies that he'd set up with this friend of his. But what happened was the friend started to see those. He was involved in some of the pitches. He was involved in some of the meetings. And so he started to, to steer away some of that to the company that he owned 50 percent in and that he was the officer on or the main officer and after a certain period of time wasn't even communicating with his partner my client he was basically going direct to those companies starting to engage in contracts and and it was all sort of done very stealthily so my client didn't find out about it until much later but by that time he'd already sort of gotten some of the clients to come over and had shut out my client from the business it made it very difficult to have him get back into the business because they were at a stalemate. It was a 50 50 ownership. They had an agreement that they had signed, not very well drafted, that basically said neither one of them can be kicked off the board and you can't add anyone else on the board. So it was always going to be a two man board unless they both agreed. And, and it was a 50 50 ownership. So you had a scenario now where you had basically a, a total stalemate. They couldn't agree. Company was paralyzed, couldn't move forward, but it did move forward because the one co-founder was just continuing to do things, even though in some cases it was violating the agreement and so on. A lot of that could have been avoided. And again, it's not just having the right agreement, but it's talking to people that have been through scenarios, have seen it, whether it's whether it's your legal advisor or it could be a friend who's been involved in a number of different companies, where some of that strategic strategic advice could have been, no, no, you definitely absolutely need to stay involved. Here's what you need to be doing. You need to have monthly meetings, weekly meetings. You need to be seeing records. You need to be checking records. There's a lot of sort of checks and balances that someone who's seen those sorts of scenarios come up could have recommended that he do on a regular basis. So as soon as he got wind of something going astray, he would have had more time to get in front of it and hopefully stop it. So that's one example as well of, of where sometimes you can see people um, getting themselves into the trouble with the right guidance. Okay, well, I, I think uh, no more questions. So we're really happy that um, we had this time together. Love presenting and, and talking to you all. Um, hopefully some of what I said today uh, resonated or at least gave you some thoughts or ideas or maybe some guidance for, for going forward with your ventures. If you have any questions or want to talk to me um, offline, by all means, reach out. We'd be happy to uh, to chat with you. And when you get the, the slides, um, check out the... Uh, 
the links. There's a, a ton of really useful information that you can find there, and hopefully you'll find uh, some good, good thoughts and um, ideas there as well. So thank you again, and I uh, look forward to talking to you at the next presentation. Take care.